All right, welcome to part three in our series on how to live on Social Security alone. So let's uh, let's move on. If uh, you're catching this in part three, what happened to the first one and two? Go back um, and then watch part one and part two, and then uh, progress to number three here. All right, let's uh, let's get off Medicare um, a little bit. Uh, I'll get back to uh, the the Medicare um, supplement Medigap plans later, but. Uh, lawyers, disability lawyers. Let's talk about this. So this is going to be, looks like number 17. So disability lawyers. Um, I did a video on this, um, but disability, when you apply for disability, so I did a video and it goes into more detail and it says, do you need a lawyer if you're going to apply for disability? So if you, you're, you or someone you know is going to apply for disability, here's my personal recommendation based on you know, uh, adjudicating, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, disability claims when I worked at Social Security. Um, for the first two levels, so when you file the initial one, that's an initial. It's the first time you file, if you were denied, then you file a request for reconsideration, uh, SSA 561. If you're denied there, then you go on to the administrative law judge and you have a hearing. If you're denied there, you can go to what's called the Appeals Council in Falls Church, Virginia. If you're denied there, then you can take it to the Federal Circuit Court and then eventually, I guess, to the Supreme Court. Um, last stages, the last sounds very difficult, sounds very lawyer-ish. So that's when I recommend you get a lawyer. But for the first couple of stages, in, in my personal opinion, um, I, you know, if, if you really want to get a lawyer, I, I always you know, hesitate to say thing, bad things about lawyer because, you know, they're very litigious. Um, but uh, the first couple of stages, pretty easy. If you hire a lawyer, they're just going to do basically what you're going to do. What you can do is, you know, go online, fill out the application or call, you know, Social Security 800-772-1213 and schedule an appointment. And the claim specialist at Social Security will ask you the same questions. You know, what's your name? Where have you worked? What's your disability? How does it prevent you from working? Because again, disability for Social Security is inability to work. And that disability has to last for 12 months or longer or end in death. Um, so the first stage, pretty easy. Um, watch my video on that. It's one of the first videos I did. It tells you more details on how to uh, apply and everything. But if you hire a lawyer and you're approved, then they get up to 25%, up, up to 20, they get 25% up to $7,200. So if your first check, you're like, you get approved and, you know, it took you a year to get approved. And so Social Security gives you, you know, kind of like a year back pay and you get your first check at $10,000. Yay, I got $10,000. Uh, yeah, the, the lawyer is going to take 72% of that for something you could have very well done yourself. So again, if you want to do a lawyer because you, you're just scared of, you know, the, the, you know, going down to the office or doing it online or whatever the case may be, then more power to you. Um, you can reach out to us, uh, fill out the form below and uh, we can find, uh, um, I know good organizations, usually the, the, uh, the, the legal, again, I hate to say, <laughs> the, the, the the ones that do a lot of advertising, um, yeah, they do a lot of advertising. Um, so there's that. Um, there are some good ones out there that really do a great job, and uh, and there's others that don't. So you can, uh, if you want a referral, uh, click on the, the link below, and uh, we can uh, find uh, someone to uh, help you file. But again, uh, the first couple of stages, you know, I. You know, you can do it yourself. It's it's relatively easy. Just watch my uh, video, and it'll give you kind of insider tips, tricks, and secrets. Um, all right, let's see here. Uh, long-term care facilities. So if you know anybody looking uh, needs long-term care, um, used to have long-term care insurance. It used to be very very popular. Uh, you know, several years ago, up until several years ago. But long-term care is just, it's just so expensive and the insurance is so expensive and you don't know if you're ever going to need it. And so some people still have long-term care insurance that they love and, you know, is 
you know, they're, they're lucky they got it when they got it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about, you know, uh, kind of long-term care insurance uh, nowadays. Uh, but if, if you want to kick it around, just, uh, again, click the link below. If you know, you know, an agent or a broker that, uh, you know, sells long-term care insurance, you know, reach out to them. But if you want, uh, you can, you know, click the button or click the, the link below in the description and say, hey, you know, I'd like to find out a little bit more about it. Um, in terms of facilities, you can go on to medicare.com. Gov. So if you have someone, um, you or a loved one that needs to go to a long-term care facility, um, Medicare.gov has got a, we a great website. So just type in Medicare.gov and I'll, I'll, put, I'll, I'll put a link on that one. So this is going to be um, number 18. Um, so in the description below under not 18, I'll put the link uh, to Medicare.gov, the, um, the long-term long care facilities. So, all right, um, let's go 19. Um, this is a, a small one, but uh, there's some people out there that uh, um, charge, which they're not supposed to, for getting a social security card. They, yeah, um, if you want a social security card, you contact this person and they, and they basically sell you an application, you know, which is crazy. Um, and it's, uh, the application is SS5. It's super, super easy to fill out. Um, I've got a video on, on how to get a social security card, you know, in my office, uh, we didn't even require applications cause it's, you know, it's just more paper, useless paper. You go up to the, the window and give the information, provide your driver's license or passport or whatever the case may be. And, uh, yeah. So, um, we just did it right at the window, got people out in and out and like five or 10 minutes. It's just a, you know, easy replace. Oh, and uh, I'm sorry for yelling there. Um, um, sometimes you don't even, don't even need to go down to the Social Security Administration. Uh, most states, they've started this online, most states you can go on to ssa.gov and um, you click on there that you want a Social Security card and if your state is participating um, and you have the right ID. And if you're just looking just for a straight replacement social security card, you can actually do it online. If you're looking to name change because you got married or divorced or something like that, or you want to change your immigration status, or your, you know, because you became naturalized or whatever the case may be, then you have to go down to the local office. But if you're just looking for a straight replacement card, go online. And if, you're, if your ID um, checks through the system, you'll get your card in about seven to 10 days. Okay. All right, that's uh, number uh, 19. Number 20, um, oh my kid, I'm getting so many calls and uh, um, texts and comments on this, expats. There's so many people moving overseas. That seems to be the big thing nowadays. Uh, again, if you're just receiving you know, $1,000, $1,800, that's an option a lot of people are taking. They are just, you know, packing their suitcase and they're moving to Portugal or Costa Rica or Panama or the Philippines or wherever the case may be. And, uh, yeah, they're, you know, at those particular locations, you can live for a thousand dollars or $1,500 a, a month. Um, and, and I'm, uh, I'm going to do a video on, on that, um, in terms of receiving your benefits overseas for the social security administration, uh, as long as you don't live in Cuba or North Korea. <laughs> so if you're looking to enjoy the beaches of North Korea, sorry, you can't take your social security check there. Uh, social security doesn't pay to people going to Cuba and North Korea as of right now. Um, any other place you're pretty much okay. Um, I think. Um, uh, the Department of Treasury has some limitations there, but in terms of Social Security, you know, those, those two are the only places that are, are off. Um, in terms of a spouse, if you have a spouse that is not a U.S. citizen or not uh, a green card holder, um, yeah, um, I will put a link um, under number 20 on uh, um, there's a great social security website that you can go into and you just click okay i am a um you know i'm getting retirement benefits but i am a citizen of japan or um you know 
England or France or wherever the case may be, and it'll tell you whether um, you can get benefits um, and what proof, what status you have to have. So it's each country is there's all kinds of differences. So um, yeah, expats. Um, one thing I would highly recommend is a lot of the expats I talk to, um, they want to get out of Medicare because they want to save, you know, the $170 or so. And they say, I'm going to be living in, you know, the Philippines or Panama. And I, you know, Medicare doesn't cover outside of the United States. There's some that cover kind of emergency, but not regular, you know, health type medical visits. Um, and they say, I want to get out of part B. Is that a good recommendation? And, uh, and my two cents is if, if your intention, if you've got health insurance there through the local system, wherever you are, um, and you're happy with it and you are going to be there forever, you know, you're going to be there forever, then yeah, you know, save yourself $170 might be, you know, rent for a month. Um, but Again, if something happens and you have to come back to the United States and you, because of an emergency, a medical emergency, and you don't have Part B, then you have to pay that and you have to have surgery or whatever the case may be, then it's 100% on you. And you say, well, I'll just go ahead and apply when I, you know, I'll set up Part B. Then you have to sign, uh, sign up in the general enrollment period, which is from January 1st until March 31st. And then they recently changed the law. If you sign up in January, it'll start in, in February. If you sign up in February, it'll start in March. Um, used to be, it, they would all start in July, but they recently changed the law, which is it's a beautiful thing on that one. Um, so you have to wait. So if, if you come in in July and because you're emergency, because you need heart surgery or something like that, then uh, well, sorry, you're going to have to wait until January and you're not going to have that health insurance part B until February. So you've got all those months there that, you know, and you're going to get penalized. So if you were over in Panama for the last two or three years, you're going to get paid. You're going to have to pay a penalty of 20%, you know, because you're over there two years, 30% if you're over there 30 years, three years, 30, three years, 10% for every year you were not receiving, not paying for part B when you were entitled to it. And same for Part D. You also have to pay a penalty for the Part D, as in drugs, the, as in dog. So, and that goes forever. So you have to pay that forever. So be careful. Um, you know, if you decide to, because I've talked to so many people that um, said, yeah, I'm, I'm never coming back. So I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, cancel my Part B. Okay. And then the next day I get a call from someone that says, yeah, I've been over here in the Philippines for the last 10 years and now I'm sick and I need to come back to the United States and get my, how do I get part B? So life is what happens while we're making other plans, right? Oh, um, 21. Um, this is a, uh, an interesting one in terms of health. Um, it's kind of, I guess, medical tourism. A lot of people know about this. Medical tourism. Um, there is a, uh, I think what, uh, you know, everybody knows about, uh, um, you know, getting uh, prescription drugs from, you know, Mexico and Canada. It's cheaper and stuff like that. But there's also, you know, places where you can, you know, if you have some heart surgery in the United States that costs you $100,000, you can jump on a plane and go someplace else and, you know, get it for $20,000 and, um, you know, same level of care, perhaps. There's a street down in Mexico that it's kind of was a dental street, and it's like all kinds of dentists that you know do all kinds of. Uh, the big thing today is implants. Everybody's always calling about implants, implants, implants. Those are crazy expensive. So not a lot of uh, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, Medicare. In, any yeah, most companies aren't handling implants right now because they're they're so expensive. But medical tourism, so. And, um, you know, like uh, the, one of the couple of the popular one is actually India and Thailand, um, Turkey for doing hair transplants. And I've been thinking about that, but yeah, I'm already married and she's gorgeous. So I'm, I'm good. So, um, 
but yeah, you're like, oh, I'm not going to Thailand to get, uh, I'm not going into India. And, you know, a lot of these doctors in these places are actually, um, you know, U.S. trained. They, you know, they went to, you know, UCLA or Johns Hopkins and has a residency there, you know, graduated from you know, University of Illinois, University of Texas, and got their medical degree and, you know, then eventually decided to go back and start up a clinic. And yeah, so they've got all the modern technology and they've been, you know, trained in the United States or in Europe or something like that. And, um, so it's the same, you know, level of care, you know, some would argue, um, but at, you know, 10 or 20% of the cost. So there's, there's that. So that's 21. All right. Um, 22. Um, this is one near and dear to my heart. Um, if you're um, looking for a little bit extra money, there is this uh, program called AARP Senior Volunteers. And I know this because in my Social Security office that I ran, we brought on more AARP Senior Volunteers than any other office in the country. I guarantee it. Um, you know, being an old Marine and uh, before I, uh, between the Marine Corps and working for, you know, welfare and Social Security, I was kind of self-employed. So I've got that kind of entrepreneurial, you know, free labor. <laughs> so I kind of jumped at that. So basically AARP, they've got these senior volunteers. So you contact AARP and ask them about this senior volunteer program. And it's a, you know, volunteer, but they give you kind of a stipend. And then what we had in our office, um, Ms. White, hello. Um, we had dozens and dozens of senior volunteer and they would come in on, you know, certain rotate. I think they could do uh, a year and they could redo it for another year or something. And they would come in and they would help. You know, we'd have to, you know, do the application and do a background check and all that kind of good stuff. And then they would come in on a, you know, a, however many hours per year or week they were allowed and they would get a stipend from AARP. They wouldn't get paid from social security. They would be, you know, volunteers for us, but AARP would pay them. It's part of a, a federal program that AARP kind of administers. So you could, you know, call them up AARP and say, Hey, I want to, you know, do the senior volunteer and I want to go to social security office or I want to go, you know, the FBI or the EPA or whatever, you know, whatever organization, whatever agency or, you know, um, federal state, local agency, in your town is accepting this and you can go there and, you know, in our case, oh, they were, they were, I mean, they helped us with the mail and, you know, sometimes kind of answering the phones and doing kind of, you know, uh, kind of administrative work. And yeah, they were phenomenal. So did a, yeah, dozens and dozens and uh, highly, highly, highly recommend uh, ARP. Um, oh, and uh, let's see, since I'm on that volunteer thing, um, there's another one that, let's put them under 23. I'm going out of order here, and as I knew I would. 23 is, uh, is the same thing for veterans. It's, again, I've, my office, we did more of these than any other office. I guarantee 100% we did more of these than any other offices. Um, NPWE, non-paid work experience. These are veterans. It's kind of like a vocational rehab. So if you or someone you know is a veteran, they've just gotten out of the military and they're looking to get back into the workforce, um, have them contact their local veterans administration and ask about NPWE, non-paid work experience and non-paid. Again, it's the Social Security Administration doesn't pay, but the VA pays them a stipend. So I think on those, it's about a six month. You can do a six month and you can do another you know, six month or something. Um, and again, you can go in there. Um, go, they, they came into my office and we had dozens and dozens and dozens. We had more than anybody on the, uh, any office in the country. Because again, you know, my office was the third busiest in the country and we were always behind. And so I was always looking to get help. And uh, yeah, these veterans came in and, you know, old Marine Corps Sergeant myself. So um, brought a lot of these veterans in. And the great thing is um, when it came to hiring, I did the hiring and it was great. You've got these, you know, veterans that come in here and they come in for six months and you see them come in every day and you see how they work and how they get along with the staff and you know how dedicated they are and all this kind of stuff. And then when you get an allocation to hire someone, 
there's a person sitting right there. So we hired many, many, many of our non-paid work experience vocational rehab veterans. So if you're a veteran and if you want to get your you know, foot in the door, you know, um, definitely apply for this. But even if you're a veteran, um, Social Security, uh, most federal agencies, they, um, they're, they're a little bit preferential treatment um, for veterans. Um, and it's easier to, it's just easier to hire veterans. So the Congress made it easier to hire veterans. So in our office, we hired tons of veterans. Um, so even if there's no allocations, go, you go into usajobs.opm.gov and you look for, you know, jobs and stuff like that, that, you know, local agencies are hiring. That's all fine and dandy. Definitely do that. But, uh, take your resume, take a resume, a very, very detailed resume very detailed you know you've got the you know one page resume and you've got the you know take a very very detailed resume down to your local office and say hey could you hand this to the district manager to the social security district manager and they get it and they will look at it and if they just happen to have an allocation at that time they'll say hey come on back let's do an interview but if not i used to keep them kind of right there and uh when i got an allocation I've got kind of stock right there. I don't think we we're supposed to keep them, but I did. Just don't tell anybody. But yeah, hired lots of veterans. So there's that. All right. So that's number 23. Where are we? Um, state burial programs. Let's go. That is number 24. Um, this is kind of a, uh, kind of another scamish thing you need to watch out there. Um, for social security, um, when someone passes, um, the survivor gets a whole $255. It's called the lump sum death payment. It's been the same since the 1950s. It's embarrassing. I've issued hundreds of thousands of those $255 checks. Nobody's ever been, wow, $255. And it's like, you'll, I think I'll go to the movies by myself. Um, so yeah, that $255 is, is an embarrassing. Um, so what some people do is they buy supplemental, if they don't have money in the bank to cover their burial and their, you know, their, their debt and medical bills or something like that. Um, then they buy life insurance slash burial insurance, you know, for 10, 20, $30,000 to cover burial. Cause burials are, you know, crazy expensive. You don't want to, you know, leave that up. I've, you know, more than enough taking survivor claims and, you know, we say, Hey, you'll get the $255 next week. And, and they'll say, well, you know, the barrel costs $12,000. That's not going to put a dent in it. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, cautionary tale from decades of experience doing this. Um, you really need to leave something for you know, the, the burial, if you, if you don't have it in the bank already. So burial insurance is, is, is a good thing, but be careful. Um, there's a lot of organizations out there, uh, kind of sales people that, uh, you know, they, they get you to call them up by and say, and you know, they, the, the advertising is, you know, state approved burial insurance, uh, burial money and stuff like that. You know, Oh yeah. State money for, to get my burial in case something happens and stuff. All insurance is state regulated so there's a department of insurance in every single state in the country and they regulate everything burial life car everything so when people they do this kind of advertising state regulated or state approved burial thingy you call it and you know you think you're going to get a free program but it's just insurance which you know it's not necessarily bad i just don't like the you know the kind of the the wording on that particular thing. Again, as usual, um, I've got uh, um, people throughout the country that I know and trust. So if you're looking um, to kick around some options and see how much, you know, five, 10, 15, $20,000 policy is in case something happens, um, fill out the, uh, the link in the description and then say, you know, click the little burial insurance thing and, and uh, I'll put you in touch with uh, someone that can uh, give you some options. Okay, so that's number 24. All right, number 25, um, Obama phone. 
yeah, people hate uh, you know Obamacare and Obama phone because it's got Obama, but um, I don't know why. Um, but <laughs> one of the crazy things about the Obama phone is it's not really the kind of the Obama. It was actually started by Ronald Reagan. Um, Ronald Reagan said, you know, people that, uh, you know, uh, kind of low income, people on disability, Social Security and stuff, you know, they, they you know, is homeless. Um, they need a they need a phone to get in contact with them. And during Reagan, it was a landline. And the only thing that changed under when Obama was president is obviously he made it as a, a cell phone. So, yeah. Um, so but the. Uh, the Obama phones, there's a serious love hate. Rant. Some people don't like because it, it says Obama, whatever the case, whatever. Um, but some people don't like because they just, they just, they're just terrible. Um, so I've had everybody I've talked to is probably about 50 like 50. Um, so it's, it's basically a free phone. How do you get it? You call up your provider, your cell phone provider, or one of the other providers and say, Hey, I like to apply for this, you know, free, you know, government phone, Obama phone, whatever you want to call it, Reagan phone, whatever. Um, and again, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a, 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 you know, low income type of subsidy type situation. So they'll evaluate to see if you're eligible, ask you all the questions about your income resources and everything. And if you're approved, you get it. Um, here's my recommendation. Some people don't like it because they're just, they're not the greatest phones in the world, but other people like it's, Hey, it's free. You know, what are you going to do? It's free. It's, I don't need anything, you know, super, you know, fantastic. I just need a phone. So some people love it, but other people don't. So here's what I recommend. Um, if you currently have a cell phone, don't cancel it. Get the, uh, if, if you're qualified, get the, get the, the government phone, the Obama phone, keep it for about a month or two. And then if you like it, Cancel your other phone, save yourself, you know, 60, 70, 70, 80, 90 dollars or whatever you're paying for your cell phone. And you, you keep the Obama phone. If you don't, oh, this, this phone sucks. I like my other phone. Return it and you've still got your, your other phone. So that's what I recommend on that. All right. Number 26, Home Weatherization Assistance Program. This is by the Department of Energy. And I'll put a link on that one. Um, so weatherization assistance. So you contact, um, there's uh, uh, representatives in each state. It's part of a uh, federal program and it's administered at the local level. And you reach out to them and, uh, and again, they kind of save you electric, uh, heating money, cooling money, whatever the case may be. Um, they weatherize your home. Again, it's good for the country, you know, save, you know, electricity and energy and all that kind of good stuff. So reach out to them and uh, they will help you weatherize your home for free-ish, right? It's never free because you pay for it in taxes all those years. All right, let's see here. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's, let's go one more. Um, oh, here is cars, automobiles. So this is number 27. Um, a few years ago, we couldn't say this, but now with the advent of Uber and Lyft and everything like that, uh, evaluate whether you really do, do you really need your car? And I, I mean, you know, America is a car culture. We, you know, you know, I got my license when I was like 15 years old, um, freedom and all this kind of good stuff. Um, but once you get, you know, to a certain stage of life, do you really need your car? Um, cause you've got, you know, you've may have, you know, the monthly payments, even if you don't have that, you have the maintenance, you have insurance, registration, all this other kind of stuff. And it's expensive. Um, when, you know, how many times do you actually, if you, you know, you're going to work every day or something like that, that's one thing, but, uh, yeah, if it's, you know, just trips to the, the supermarket or something like that or doctor's office. And if, again, if you have a Medicare Advantage, you have transportation funds in there. Uh, again, check to make sure if you do or not. Um, but yeah, it might just be cheaper just to call an Uber every now and then. So save yourself some money. Kick around that. Um, yeah, kick around that. And, you know, insurance, um, uh, we're adding people, um, those I had the same insurance 
since I was in the Marine Corps because the company, let's just say it's government employees insurance company. You'll get what the company I had. And uh, yeah, uh, I guess once I evaluated many decades later and realized, wow, I guess I was paying for an animated character. <laughs> this is crazy expensive what I was paying. Um, and when there's other cheaper alternatives out there. So if you want, yeah, we can set you up some and see if we can save you some money there if you're interested. So, all right. Uh, I think that's it for that one. Um, so again, uh, um, share, uh, scribe, all that kind of good stuff. And we will see you. This is uh, number three. And we'll see you for number four soon. Take care. Have a beautiful day.